right, hello everybody and welcome to this year's Ask About Paleontology live panel. Uh, this is, we've done this the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past we've been on it, Karen's been on it, Trevor Valley was on it, yep. but this year we are virtual, which means we are in a slightly new format with a, cup, with, uh, uh, a significant uh, addition to our cast, <laughs> but the format is the same. We're going to be taking questions about paleontology dinosaurs, Ice Age, whatever you want to ask about. Uh, we've got some DragonCon folks behind the scenes that'll be feeding us questions from Discord and from other places, mm -hmm. and they'll pop up on the screen as we go. But I suppose we should start with introductions. Yes. So let's start with our newest edition. Uh, Riley, introduce yourself. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Riley Black. I'm the author of the books uh, Skeleton Keys, My Beloved Brontosaurus, written in stone. And uh, did you see that dinosaur is the latest one? It's a search and find book coming out. I blogged for a number of years at uh, Lay Labs, which has been under Wired and National Geographic and Scientific American. I've uh, freelanced all over and I do a lot of field work. I've done a lot of field work uh, in Western North America from about Saskatchewan in Canada to El Golfo Mex uh, in Mexico, uh, mostly looking at dinosaurs, but really just like any kind of so go out and chase with the museum crew. So that's my background. Cool, awesome. Karen? Hello, my name is Karen Henning and I'm a scientific illustrator, member of the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators. I have done work for the Raymond M. Elf Museum of Paleontology, the uh, Harvard uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology, that's a mouthful, and I am currently working on projects with the John Day Fossil Beds National Monument and the Hickerman Fossil Beds National Monument, which I'm super excited about because I get to draw a sloth. <laughs> Yay, sloths. Very cool. Hey, Will. Hi, David. Introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm Will uh, Harris of the Common Descent Podcast, Woo. and uh, I've been going to Dragon Con for, since I was a teenager, so for a long time, and I'm a science educator, uh, worked at the Great Fossil Site Museum, uh, currently as a math tutor uh, during all of this chaos, and <laughs> uh, am one half the Common Descent Gray Fossil Site and Museum here in East Tennessee. And we have, our podcast is about paleontology, evolution, life history. And between the two of us, we've done a bunch of paleontology related mm -hmm. work in a handful of different places, mostly young and modern stuff. Yes. Uh, we're, we're big fans of reptiles. Yes. I think we all are here. That might be the stretch. If somebody <laughs> asked about graptolites or something, we might need to be like, uh, hold on, let me check something. <laughs> That's I'm going to just ask Professor Google what they think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next year, we'll have to get a uh, uh, get some invert people. Yeah. Right yes. <laughs> All right. So we're ready to take questions. So I believe the format is that they will uh, be fed to us here on the screen, and we'll read them out as they come in. Like, although Will and David, did you get a couple on Twitter? I noticed on one of your we did get a couple on asked about Cenozoic mammals and such things. Do you have those? I can bring that up. We can start reading off those while we wait for the other questions to come in. Yeah. Why not? Um, I was just jazzed that someone wanted to know about Cenozoic mammals. That's <laughs> true. Let me see if I can find that one. All right. So this is a question from Sam who asked, aside from the cats everyone knows about, what were some of the other top predators of the Ooh. Cenozoic? Oh, good question. Go ahead. Riley, are you excited? <laughs> I certainly am, yeah. I'm, I'm champing at the bit, as it were, to talk about <laughs> Cenozoic carnivores. Well, I mean, the Cenozoic is about 66 million years long, right? So that's like a huge amount of time. We've all had all these turnovers, but uh, I'll start with one. Otherwise, I'll go on for like 45 minutes and we won't have time for other things. But uh, was that Masonicids? So in the Eocene, uh, these animals that are often described as wolves with hooves, which I think is just kind of a neat expression because you want to say like wolves with hooves, like, <laughs> you know, right? But that's more or less what they look like. They kind of look like Gamork from Never Ending Story. Not quite as big, but these things have like long faces, lots of teeth, instead of claws on their feet, it's more hoof-like appendages, long, almost tiger-like tails. We don't know a whole lot about how they're living and what they're doing other than just chasing down other critters to eat but they're one of these really unique Cenozoic, early Cenozoic carnivores that showed up before the dogs and cats and more familiar critters. Very cool. I would add that um, uh, the question specifies cats, but I think that 
it's important to note that a lot of the cat things that are famous throughout the Cenozoic are not cats. Yes, very true. So early Cenozoic, you had the Nimravids, which are the yeah. small saber-toothed cats. Oh. Saber-toothed, cat-like, but not cats. Yeah. Not even carnivorans, truly, I don't think. Or maybe they're... They are. They, yeah, they're, yeah. they're full forms. Yeah, but they're, they're like cat-ish is one of like which came first, right? Yeah, right. Yep. <laughs> And they the, had the very interesting jaw structure where the, the uh, bottom part of the um, anterior part of the mandible would actually come down to almost cradle those canines. And, and that was, I believe that's a uniquely Nimravid uh, invention. Yeah. I don't think any of the saber tooth cats brought that forward. They had that yeah, like, a little Gabardon. bit of Smilodon. And uh, there was a paper at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology annual meeting the last time I went when it was in New Mexico suggesting that uh, these saber-toothed critters called barbaroophilids are just nimravids. That instead of being separate families, is just like the continuation. So it gives them a few million more years. And if, if that turns out to be accurate, that's pretty good. That's interesting because barbaroophilids, another famous saber-toothed group, I know at one point were classified as felids, actual cats. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they've kind of uh, bounced around as we've tried to figure out exactly where they fit. Yeah. The creodonts were a, a, a very... Uh, varied group as well. Um, and I, I, I seem to remember that the uh, Barbara Fielid, um specimen that I saw over at John Day was within that group. I know I worked on a creodon um, called Hemipsalodon while I was there. And it's they described it to me as a pig, rhino, tiger, and bear kind of shoved together. It's a little of everything. And it's it gets challenging when you're trying to reconstruct an animal that just does not look like anything mm -hmm. that we have on Earth today. Um, and yet the only way to really describe it is to take pieces of things that we're familiar with and piece it together. Um, it, it was a really cool animal to get to know. So we've got another question uh, from Liz, who asks, would these cat-like creatures have any reaction to catnip? Ooh. Had catnip even evolved by that point? Fascinating. I don't know. What's the, what, uh, someone's got to remind me of the chemistry of catnip. Yeah, that, why catnip does what it that's does. That's what I was going to say. I know it has like an actually drug-like reaction in the cat's brain, but I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's comparable to. Yeah, I'm trying to look up right now, like what group of plants it even belongs I think to. It's valerian, because I know valerian is a is a plant that's akin to catnip that uh, cats definitely react to, and I'm not finding anything specific about when that showed up. Do we know how many carnivorans react to catnip? I was going to say, I wonder what <laughs> other animals react to catnip. Yeah, that's I know just... servals do. <laughs> what does? Servals do. All right. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 House cats. I wonder how many big cats have ever been tested with catnip. Yeah. I think if, there's a thread on that out there somewhere. Right? Some, somebody somewhere has to have done this. See, because I'm sure that that's, that very likely may not be AZA accredited <laughs> uh, enrichment uh, or proved enrichment. So they probably have a lot of zoos haven't tried it out. Yeah. So but from what I can there find, are accredited. Seems... Catnip is related to mint because there's also cat mint, which I hadn't heard about until oh, right. right now. And it probably goes back to like either the very end of the Cretaceous or the beginning of the uh, Eocene. So, yeah, I mean, maybe a similar kind of reaction could have evolved. It's just, it's hard to tell. Like, I'm not, I'm trying to figure out how would we even like test this? Right. right? It does make me imagine a big saber-toothed cat rolling That's around. What I was about ground. to say, "That's what I want art of now." Yep, <laughs> That's what I want to make art of now. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you do, uh, share it with us. We'll we'll spread it around. Awesome. <laughs> All right, we've got a question from Ooh. Aaron. Who asks, Ooh, that's a good one. Snake questions: Has a species of snake ever re-evolved legs? Good question. So uh, there was a long period of time, and in fact, it continues today that snakes have retained legs. Yes. So there were a lot of there was a lot of snake diversity in the Cretaceous, where early snakes still had legs, itty bitty um, dinky legs, but still. typically the back ones. And there are snakes today that still have legs. Pythons bitty, bitty, and boas have these little tiny vestiges of legs uh, back in the the hip region. Well, hip, what used to be the hip region. 
Uh, and on the outside, you'll see these little spurs that stick out, pelvic spurs. Um, and I feel like I've seen discussions of the reemergence of legs around those because we're not entirely sure what bones those are mm -hmm. comparable to. But I don't think we have any evidence definitively of legs ever re-evolving in anything, I don't think. Yeah, it would have to be some kind of mutation allowing like the developmental pathway, right, to like yep. redevelop that leg. And even then you might have like lost genes, get what's called a stop codon where you have one mutation that stops that expression. So you get something that's like leg-like, but it's not going to just function like a, a regular leg. Um, and that's something called Dolo's Law in evolution. That generally when something is lost, it's not re-evolved. I know some people have questioned that in, in this or that case, but in terms of something like a multi-part anatomical structure, it would have to, if it showed up again, it would almost have to evolve afresh, I guess. It'd have exactly. to be yeah, something to, to make it a new version of that leg instead of just reappearing. Yeah, it's you imagine something significant with the environment um, that the animal had evolved to live in would need to occur as well to, to have the need uh, to do something like that, because that's a legs are a huge thing to lose and they're a huge thing to get back into. Um, and um, I know that animals that have lost things like eyes. Uh, that, that live in dark spaces. It takes many, 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 many generations for animals to, to lose eyes. So you have to think about how long a time period they've been in the environment where eyes are just not necessary. Yeah. And this reminds me of um, the famous Jack Horner, how to build a dinosaur, chickenosaurus thing, because it's based upon a lot of these ideas. They can flip genetic switches on and off. Mm -hmm. free expression of things but like when we talk about chickens with teeth like you know these women else it's not something like this that we're going to get covered in feathers it's like okay it's technically a tooth on there but it's not like they have these serrated you know banana sized t-rex teeth or something like that it's like it's it's, it's a lot more nuanced than those things like, uh it, it seems kind of counterintuitive when you consider that a, a group that had a feature once they've lost it don't really have it as an option unless it's still hiding in the genetics because the, the evolution doesn't have like a memory or a like oh yeah we use that once we can pull that out of the clock no it's, it's in the recycle bit exactly and we could just yeah. restore it yeah it's it is gonna now treat this new body form as the starting point you know snake is now where they're starting from so if we did have it way in the future legged snakes I think you're right, Riley, that very likely their legs would be different than other tetrapod legs, other legged animals, because it would be something new. It would be, they'd be adapted ribs or something like that. <laughs> That's Excellent. cool to think about. That's right? really cool to think about. I'm picturing a centipede snake in my head right now. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is good for our speculative evolution of a world taken over by snakes. Yep. <laughs> Kaiju Mapping at Discord asks, what is your opinion on the new article about Megalodon size? Wow. I also have not actually read this article yet. so Yeah, I pulled it up while we were having a look, because there's been a couple. Like, I know a lot of headlines have been said, like, you know, for the first time ever, you know, this has been determined. Like, there have been plenty of estimates yes. before. I think there was one even last year, um, you know, estimating, like, around 45 to 50 feet maximum. Like, I think this one, they tried to get a lot more precise with sort of the depth of particular fins and things like that. So of course, like they just copy the diagram in the article, so everything's in meter. So I have to do the conversion because I'm not that good of a scientist yet. So Megalodon, for anyone who doesn't recognize the name, is the famous giant shark. Yes. Uh, typically pr uh, portrayed as very great white, great white shark like, mm -hmm. uh, and famously 40 or 50 or 60 feet long, uh, according to these various estimates over the years. And the, the reason that there's been such debate over the size is because sh sharks, being cartilaginous fish, do not leave behind skeletons typically. They leave behind lots of teeth. But teeth is a very small part of the body. So <laughs> you're having to make extrapolations based on modern sharks, how big the jaw would be based on these teeth. And we do have some partial jaws, and we do have some partial vertebrae. Uh, like backbone, but you're making an estimate on size on a very small part of the body that can be very uh, different in different sharks. So the debate for years and years. I think there's a specimen that's attributed to uh, Megalodon in the Sawyer Museum. I think in Switzerland, but it hasn't been described yet, and it kills me because I've seen pictures of this thing. 
and it shows the proportions of it's not like the biggest one that ever was but at least would like be a check on the proportions but yeah. it hasn't been described yet and like who knows like given how many of these sharks have moved between like the great white shark side of things to the megalodon side of things to Makos to yeah like there are all these different intertwined groups and that's part of like the size and proportion stuff too right because for a while we thought mm -hmm. oh, okay megalodon's just a big great white shark basically but now that we think it's closer to Makos like the new Smithsonian mount is a lot more slender and the proportions are a bit different. That affects all these expectations. Right. The, the teeth actually. Nice. <laughs> that's, a, yeah, that's a little, taking it a little bit far out. Yeah, I love that that movie was like, uh, you know, we need a, a big shark. Let's go with Megalodon. It's like, cool. It's like, all right, now let's make it a little bit bigger when it's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> it's that. You know, would have been okay with that? If at the end it was just like Pac Man gobbling up like stuff in his face. Instead, it's like this they, they tease this beach full of people. Like, I'm not all that in for Carnage normally, but like, okay, we have this awesome setup and like almost nothing happens. <laughs> My biggest complaint about that movie is that you took the biggest shark ever and it sank one boat off screen and one boat on screen by jumping on it. Spoilers for anyone out there. Uh, <laughs> But it, it it was it sh this should have been like battleship versus a shark, you know, not Jaws, but a little bit bigger. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think Jaws actually did uh, better in terms of uh, uh, casualty count. <laughs> yeah. Although here's the neat thing, because people don't believe me when I tell them this: if you go back and you read Jaws, there's an implication that the shark in Jaws is actually a megalodon. The great white sharks and megalodon are the same thing. Oh. And that's why they came away with like the beefed up size and like different. Things. That, yeah, Benchley said in interviews that that was his uh, his inspiration for writing that. Cool. Interesting. I didn't know. Time that. to go read Jaws. I was about to say, yeah, I've never read it. All right, our next question from Luxorian is: What's the most interesting cutting art, state of the edge technology Ooh. used for determining determining what an extinct species actually looked like? Uh, I think we should go to our scientific illustrator <laughs> to start with this one. I think probably the CT scanner. Um, we're getting so much detail in terms of information on how uh, these animals' brains were constructed and by by proxy how they worked. Um, by scanning the shape of the, the brain case, you're able to tell whether this is an animal that is visually adapted, whether it's adapted to have exceptional hearing. Um, and then you can extrapolate what is happening with the appearance based on that. Um, it's still a, a guess. It's a best guess kind of situation because until we start finding more mummies a la Leonardo and some of the other hadrosaurs that have been found, um, it's it really is the best educated guess. But yeah, the CT scanner is giving us a lot of information that's very useful for reconstruction. I love how sci-fi our analysis of fossils is getting. We're like various scanning tools is, are coming to bear and it's awesome yeah I, we were holding up you mentioned brain cases and we, i've we've got a whole selection of fossil stuff here <laughs> to show off if it comes up this is a ct scanned and 3d printed in this weird chrome plastic Ooh. uh taper brain case from the gray fossil site <laughs> uh so this we had a skull of one of our tapers tapirus pokensis pokes dwarf taper scanned through the skull and then uh one of our students i believe actually created this inverse digital model so the the fill inside the brain case and then we printed it so this is a, a an ancient taper brain that's awesome yeah. and so i would take that to a scientist who um does mammalogy studies with uh the the structure of brains and figure out okay those two structures on the front what is that does that is that indicate visual acuity does that indicate that there are um, there's a, an increased sense of smell. What are we looking at here? And then I would base a reconstruction on the the head um, based on what the brain is telling me about what senses this animal would have had beefed up in order to live its life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's so neat to see the ways that CT scanning and 3D modeling tech can like reconstruct skulls because so often like skulls are either disarticulated meaning all the bones are kind of separate from each other or they're distorted so they're kind of smushed one way or another like if you think of um 
the T-Rex at American Museum of Natural History, AMH 5027. You look at it one way, it's like, that's really cool. And then you look at it head on, it's all kind of like lopsided. <laughs> we can undo that and get a better picture of it. And the ways that some paleontologists are using this to actually make predictions about what some transitional forms, for example, might have looked like. I, for uh, Dino Nerds for Black Lives Matter, on that video stream, I talked with Kieran McNulty, uh, who works in Kenya on fossil primates, mm. and using these techniques to scan the existing skulls, compare them to each other, see what's different, and then say, okay, given this much evolutionary time, what would we expect a last common ancestor to look like and 3D model that as well, not just like well, sketch it cool. out, but like base it on these actual anatomical points. So I think that's really, really cool. Like, they mm -hmm. get into this kind of sci fi stuff. Yes. Sarah asks, I know there have been recent discoveries with Spinosaurus's tail shape, Spinosaurus being the famous big carnivorous dinosaur with the sail on its back. Have there been other recent discoveries that have changed or put into question previously assumed anatomy? Ooh, interesting. So the the, the Spinosaurus study that, that Sarah is referring to is a recent discovery that published the first ever uh, apparently good look at Spinosaurus's tail which found that it had these long spines that led the artists to reconstruct it as flatter, more like a croc tail, in support in the, the those authors' view of the notion that it may have used it uh, like a croc does For to propulsion. propel through the water. Uh, but new anatomical discoveries are constantly making mm -hmm. us revisit old uh, assumptions about how fossil animals lived. Yeah, uh, I guess... Because how often do you find skulls, for example? How many, just if we even constricted to dinosaurs, like how many are missing most of the skeleton? How many things are named from, you know, a partial collection of bones that we know from the formation, we know from some bits of anatomy that's probably new, but almost any additional discovery of that animal is going to add something new. But the thing that springs to mind is that uh, Titanosaur embryo, yes. that was in the news about a week ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this embryonic little long neck, you know, one of these sauropod dinosaurs. So basically, I think as John Cleese once said, it's you know thin on one end, much much bigger in the middle, you know thin again at the far end. One of these dinosaurs. <laughs> so this is an embryo <laughs> that big, and it had um, this really neat egg tooth. So it's got a big eye and a short face. It was like kind of a dinosaur version of a puppy. Like they were cute as well. We know from the fossil record, but on the front of its face, it had this long extra pointed thing that there's an egg tooth on top, but then something extra, they called it a horn. And we had no idea that that was there. And since we don't know what species this animal is, like did that entirely get resorbed, uh, resorbed back into the body? Was this part of the ornamentation when the animal grew older? We know so few sauropod skulls that who knows, like many of them might've had horns or something extra that we have no idea about. So stuff like that, that really just was like, wait, like how is that even a thing? And I, that's why I love paleo. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very cool question. The answer to that question is yes, all the time, forever. <laughs> Matt on Discord asks, when I was a kid, I thought it'd be fun to dig up skeletons in the desert. What cons should I have considered to ensure I was making a balanced approach to a career choice? Get a hat, get a, get a nice big hat. Yeah. <laughs> I personally well, have never reality is wrong. Who owns the land? Um, I mean, that's been uh, a, a huge, huge thing um, since, uh, I mean, watch Dinosaur 13 and you'll find out the pros and cons of uh, digging on anybody's land. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, when you get out into the desert, most of that land, I want to say most of it is probably BLM. Um, and that gets you into a whole um, system of legalities that can get quite complex. Um, in terms of the uh, practicalities of field work, I think that uh, Riley, you can speak to that better than I can. Yeah, and just on Dinosaur 13, it does reflect um, how complicated these things are. It's the story of, you know, Sue the T-Rex and how complex that was. I think that movie is a little too oversympathetic to um, the people who, you know, uh, Pete Larson and his, his group, but that's a whole other issue that I'm sure could be its own track about legality and fossils in the commercial market. But in terms of uh, field work itself, like it is pretty hard. Uh, you know, like it's that's why we call it work, right? It's like there's bugs that are constantly biting you. You're getting sunburned. You're getting dehydrated. You're in these places that are pack in, pack out. 
uh, if you fall and you twist an ankle in many cases, like, you know, you better have a spot or someone nearby to, you know, ask for help. They're pretty remote. You don't realize how dangerous it is until something goes wrong. But in terms of just career paths, I want to make clear, like, paleontology has so many different career paths that are outside of field work. We love this, like, kind of Indiana Jones image and, like, going out in the field. Like, I've got pictures like that, too. I used to have the hat. I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'll own it. But I used to, you know, play dress up as well. But there, there's also mitigation paleontology. There's people who are lab paleontologists who specialize in things like CT scanning or isotopes or things like that. There are curators, there are educators, there are writers like myself. Uh, there are so many different ways to be in the field. So I just don't want anyone to have the impression that like you better be ready to like take a canteen and a pickaxe out in the middle of nowhere and come back with a skull and that's all that paleontology is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We can attest neither one of us has ever had to take a canteen and a pickaxe and go out to the middle of nowhere. We've I, I, we've been fortunate enough to dig in fairly kind places. Yeah, all of my digging <laughs> has been here at the Gray Fossil site, which is behind a museum. That's why the museum was built there. So it's literally in a backyard. Oh, yeah. You're three minutes from McDonald's. You're three minutes yeah. from McDonald's. You're a <laughs> hundred foot walk from a bathroom and a fridge. Um, <laughs> and we set up pavilions. So at no point did I even have to put on sunscreen because if I had, I would have worked mm -hmm. in the lab. Put a tent. Yeah, right? <laughs> because, compared to the field work I'm used to. Yeah, that's like every amenity. You can spare no expense oh, kind of thing. Yeah, it is the absolute top luxury oh, of paleontology. The biggest gray. tool we use is this. It's soft clay. So we just are. <laughs> so, yeah, like you don't have to break your back to do paleo. <laughs> I'm usually in a, in a dusty basement somewhere if I'm working on site at a museum, if I'm not in my, my own studio. Um, so uh, I think the, the common factor is being used to being by yourself and very focused, because I think no matter what you're doing in paleontology, um, that is a skill that is, is necessary and you need to be really comfortable with that, working with blinders on and really concentrating on what you're doing. The way I used to describe it to the tours when I, we'd go past the lab and I'd be describing like, what are all the, what are the different jobs that we do here? You know, what are all the different tasks? And the way I would say it is every job in paleo is tedious. You just have to find the right tedious for you. Right. Yeah. But the surprises make it worth it. It reminds me of like ideas about um, gambling or other things with like intermittent rewards where yeah. like you might lose your shirt normally but that one thing we'll keep you going to the next time. Like there was one particular trip that I was on. We were in the Triassic near uh, Canyonlands National Park here in Utah. And somebody found most of a phytosaur skull in the block. So Ooh. I'm normally a very competitive person, but in the field, it's like, I got to find something better than that. Like I need to find <laughs> something to make it worth today. So I get up on this ledge and it's really kind of difficult to walk across. And I get about a hundred feet along this rock ledge. The rock on the wall is red. Underneath my feet, it's kind of pale blue. And it looks like that the ground reaches up to give me a high five. And it's the back foot of an Aetosaur, what we call uh, one of these Triassic croc relatives that looked kind of like a combination between a crocodile and armadillo. And it was the back foot and the front foot on this one piece. And in that area, there are a whole bunch of other tracks and things. And I've been like going on the high from that for years now, or even if I don't find anything, it's like, well, at least I had that really cool one. So that's the kind of thing that will keep drawing you back in. Those things are so cool looking. They just they just have that armor that just yeah. oh, it's so satisfying to draw. Yeah. That's no. They are always close to the top of my list when people are like, if you could bring something back to be a pet, I was like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> herb, herbivorous crocs, and I'd be happy. Well, yeah, and after that, yeah. Yeah, speaking of herbivorous crocs, our next question comes from Twitter. Why was the Triassic period so weird? <laughs> Did you have a favorite weirdo from then? And was there a time that was even weirder? My weirdo just got mentioned. The, the Your... Adasaurs absolutely are my favorite weirdo from the Triassic. So the Triassic period is the first period of the Mesozoic era. So it is the beginning of the age of reptiles and it sees the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. But it was this time of evolutionary experimentation where nature was basically going, what? How many bizarre things can I do with a reptile? And then just doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, I know what my favorite weirdo is, but I'll let other people go first. The science. Okay. The science. Science. I love them. They're, they're just in this weird liminal space between reptile and mammal where things haven't quite figured out what was working well. So they, it just did everything. Yeah. And there's an elephant size one, which is so damn cool in Poland that they found a Dysonda on the size of an elephant. It's like, how does he 
<laughs> I think mine is going to be uh, a topo dentata. So it was something where there was an initial reconstruction based upon the first skull. And this was uh, an aquatic reptile, marine reptile that evolved during the Triassic. Like you have this evolutionary expansion, as David was saying, after the end Permian mass extinction, it's kind of like open skate for evolution. Like all niches are open. Let's see what happens. So a whole bunch of reptile lineages, like the ancestors of ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, and a whole bunch of other groups that went extinct during the end of the Triassic, they all went to the water. And Atopa dentatus was one of them. And the first reconstruction that was done on the first paper, it looked like if you took a scotch tape dispenser and you turned it upside down, so it's got that like kind of like curve and then the circular part behind it. It's this, and it seemed to have like a split upper lip with the teeth like going in between like a zipper. And like definitely looked like something that came out of a creature shop or something like that. It, like, it did not look like it should be real. And it turns out that that wasn't quite right. A better skull reshaped it into more of a, like a Hoover kind of vacuum attachment with all the little pegs and stuff up front. But it's still super weird. And this is something that showed up within about like 10 or 15 million years of the beginning of the Triassic. Just had its niche, totally disappeared, left no descendant groups. But it just speaks to just how, how like evolution was running riot during those first 15 million years or so. My favorite thing that the Triassic experimented with was gliding in reptiles. And there were a bunch of different lineages that did the, like a modern gliding lizards, which have a flap of skin across the, the ribs. But my favorite is Charovipteryx, which is an animal that was lizard-like, not, not quite a lizard, but a lizard-like, whose main gliding membrane appears to have been between its legs so that legs spread out, it would have formed a delta wing shape as it glided through the air, which is a, a shape of gliding that has not ever been seen anywhere else, modern or extinct, which is just, and I even remember there was at least one paper that did a bunch of biomechanical estimates mm -hmm. on it. And at least that paper estimated that it might even have been more efficient than other forms of gliding, which is, which awesome. is very, very cool, wow. weird looking animal. Yeah. Do you know if they've built a model on that and done wind tunnel work with it to see? I don't know. I, I know that, that that analysis may have just been based on pure math. I don't know if they've actually built models of it. That would be so cool though. As a kid, yeah. I remember they had these little pterosaur models where it was like, it came in a little flat package that you buy at like lunchtime for a dollar. <laughs> and it'd be like the pterosaur, like, you know, from the side view and then you had the wings that go on it and there'd be a little propeller at the front to, you know, keep it stable or whatever. But uh, if they could make a Charvipteryx version of that, that'd be, I'd buy you know a dozen and just spend all day. Absolutely. Uh, Zia, uh, clarification. Karen, you said Cynodont. C Y N O Daunt. <laughs> oh, okay. Then uh, my, I thought you said I Cynodont before. Yes, but Cynodonts are also really awesome. <laughs> uh, Raphael asks, could ancient dinosaurs smell flowers? Most of them didn't get a chance. That's true. Uh, so flowers as we know them don't show up until the Cretaceous period. So like your Brachiosaurus and your, your Dilophosaurus and Coelophysis and those earlier dinosaurs never encountered true flowers. Yep. Um, go ahead. Oh, yeah. But it's neat that at the end, the very end of the Cretaceous, at least in North America, like it blew my mind to learn that. Uh, dogwood trees and magnolias and sorry, some very familiar plants that are around today that have these really ornate flowers like they were around. I think if you look at Salinger's famous uh, Age of Reptiles mural at the very, very end, everything gets like very lush and kind of familiar in this sort of strange way that you have Triceratops and T-Rex and stuff like that. But these trees that might be in your backyard. So I don't know like how I imagine that dinosaurs probably could have smelled them. I mean, many birds today are nectivores as well. Maybe there are some small dinosaurs we don't yet know about that specialize on flowers, but I imagine they would have had some influence so even just putting the pollen out in the air. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, we do know that by the, even back in the Cretaceous, you see co-evolution between insects and flowers. Yes. <clears throat> and we know that today, a lot of insect flower interactions are done through scent. Mm -hmm. And there's a real good chance that they were smelly flowers back then to attract insects. And so flowers would have almost certainly been smelly and if dinosaurs had good smellers, then sure, they absolutely could have and stopped going, and smelled the roses. And going back to... There were roses. Uh, yeah, I, that, that I don't know. <laughs> but going back to Karen's point about scanning brains, we do know that a number of dinosaurs show really good senses of smell. So, yeah, if they were if they were fragrant flowers back then, then 
Yeah, they should have been able to smell. Great question. <laughs> I would imagine the animals that are eating those flowers and leaves would have, um, just by virtue of the fact of how they're feeding, would possibly have helped pollinate as well. Oh, yeah. Like, you don't have to be tiny to be a pollinator. Uh, Liz on Discord asks, please explain Charo Vipterix and why we don't have any extant flyers that seem to do that. Um, so before uh, our uh, behind the scenes folks brought up a picture of the Meg, if you if you want to try to Google Charo Vipterix and show a picture of it, maybe we could get that up there. That would be the US. Um, I've heard the explanation, the explanation that I've heard for why we don't have living flyers or gliders that do that is that it might be, even if it's a potentially better way to glide, it might be harder to evolve. Well, and what I wonder, what I always wonder about seeing Shara Victorix uh, is less about like, how did you glide with those? Is how did you walk? Well, and that's exactly, yeah, yeah. If your legs are your uh, gliding membrane, you know, we, we think of most gliders today. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There you go. Most gliders today, and I've seen reconstructions that even make it a more complete sort of like height. full triangle. Uh, but gliders today tend to glide between the arms. So like flying squirrels, uh, it's a flap of skin between the arms and legs. Uh, Draco lizards, mm -hmm. it's coming off the side of the body. Bats, you know, it's the front le front arms that are wings that they have uh, used to fly. It might be that getting that tra track of evolution started mm -hmm. of expanding the skin off the arms is something that doesn't get in the way as much. It might be that Shara Victorix happen to live some bizarre lifestyle where having flaps of skin on your legs didn't interfere with what it was doing and it happened to be free to go along that trajectory yeah. it might just be that it's just something that is such a weird thing to do that most times it would potentially get started it either gets in the way or goes in another direction it's not yeah, and there's practical there's just a related paper about this about extant gliding mammals and like is this uh, a a uh, example of complete convergence because it's often a textbook example, right? That you have things like sugar gliders and flying squirrels and colugos, and they all are mammals that glide. But what they found in the study was that the only thing that they really had in common was elongation of the limbs, like even more so than like an arboreal animal. But whether it's the upper arm bone or the humerus being elongated, or the lower arm bone, like that's all different. It's often determined by where that membrane attaches, whether it's the wrist or the elbow. So it, it kind of goes to prove that with gliding animals, at least it might be just, there was something that natural selection could act upon that was more malleable in one part of the animal than another. But there are more, there's more than one way to do this. It's not like there's this adaptive peak that everybody is headed to in the same way. It's more like this open playing field where it's like, okay, what are all the different ways that from point A you can get to a gliding animal? Yeah, well, and, uh, on the note of the bats, that made me think as well uh, that they're a great example for why I always found this one weird is when, you know, doing it between your limbs or like, you know, if gliding frogs use their hands and feet, mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't change them as limbs very much. You know, like you can still walk, you can still climb, but when you use just a pair of limbs to turn those into gliding or flying apparatus, if anyone has ever seen a bat not on a cave wall and like on the ground, they're horribly awkward unless you're a vampire bat or the, the <laughs> gallop. Yeah, the <laughs> island bats that forage. Uh, so like I can only imagine how awkward this animal was. And yeah, like most gliders don't seem to go the route of I'm going to turn this one pair of limbs into a super weird structure, except for the couple that we still have. Bats have repurposed the the hind limb to tail membrane yep. several species, but they use it as a food net. Yes, they'll zero in and they'll they'll use it to bring food to their face. I mean that that's clearly not the case with our glider here. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Actually, that is yeah, a really good point. It is useful in in that uh, particular incarnation. Mm -hmm. uh, we should make a, a one last point that bats today and pterosaurs, the flying reptiles of the Mesozoic, did have gliding membranes between their legs, yes. the Europatagium, but it wasn't their primary gliding surface like Charovipteryx's very strange structure. Really yeah. good question. Uh, Stay Curious Karen asks, can you comment about hair on dinosaurs slash lizards? Well, the bad news about that is 
it looked like hair, but they're actually feathers and proto feathers, right? So we have hair and very early proto feathers looked like hair, very simple sort mm -hmm. of single tubular uh, filaments. The difference you can see when you zoom in really close is that our hair kind of looks scaly almost. It's a much different texture, has a different kind of makeup uh, to it. And then from there, you know, you have all the different feather variations, like even on non-flying dinosaurs. And just to comment on that, because I know there's a lot of debate about who had proto feathers, who didn't, you know, ooh, I have a patch of T-Rex skin the size of a quarter. That means it was scaly. Well, not necessarily. It, it seems that based upon what we're gathering, that you have true feathers and proto feathers and lots of body coverings on like the, the theropod side of the family tree from birds, their closest relatives among the Salurosaurs, some outliers as well. And then all the way on the other side of the family tree, like near horned dinosaurs, you have animals with bristles and protofeather type body coverings. Some are quite complex. So either protofeathers go all the way back to the last common ancestor, not only of dinosaurs, but probably of pterosaurs as well, because when you know pterosaurs are fuzzy and those are probably the same structures, or that there was just something about the development of these animals that allowed them to evolve fuzz and fluff and feathers over and over and over again. So it's kind of, if you want to draw a dinosaur with feathers on it, go for it. It's just as justifiable as the scaly version. Yep. Uh, and we should specify that dinosaurs had that fuzz, pterosaurs had fuzz, lizards. So dinosaurs and pterosaurs are on the archosaur branch of mm -hmm. reptiles. Mm -hmm. Lizards and all of their incredible incarnations are on the Lepidosaur branch, and those uh, have not been seen with fuzzy, you know, you'll get like, you know, spines and stuff, Yeah. but you don't get fuzz. Hair is a mammal trait, although there is the possibility that mammalian ancestors also had hair-like structures yeah. as well. And even within Archosauria, the croc side of things hasn't shown any of those structures. So that seems to be a fairly unique dinosaur pterosaur lineage feature. Yeah. Which if I'm doing a reconstruction where there's wiggle room on it, um, I, do, I always defer to the client, whoever's asking mm -hmm. me to do it, um, because it's generally for something specific that they are involved in. And as cool as it might look, um, I'm, I'm not there to put my personal spin on it. I'm there to accurately portray what they're asking me to portray. Um, so, uh, but I mean, given the opportunity, I would make everything fuzzy. So, yeah. 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 in the paleo art realm, because I remember they used to be so outrageous, right? That you had like an illustration of the dinosaur with like a little mohawk of feathers, and that was at it. And people were going like, "Ooh, like you don't know that." And now it's so common. So, as a pale, as someone works in paleo art, like, what do you think about the trend of like the expanding fluffiness or the fluffalization? I think as Jamie Hedden once put it, of dinosaurs in art. You know, I, th I think it depends on what you're portraying. I think it depends on, on what kind of reconstruction you're doing, because certainly um, this kind of uh, feathery covering for thermoregulation, completely plausible, especially, especially for juvenile animals, which really need to work to retain that heat and that can be shed later on. Um, I just... Like all paleo art, it depends on what you're trying to convey, what message you are trying to augment. Um, and uh, again, that goes back to whatever material you are illustrating for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But personally, as an opinion, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question is, how does that coevolution between insects and flowers occur? Yeah. Like, how do the genes know to make insects look like flowers, et cetera? Uh, and no, that is totally on topic. Uh, in fact, it, it makes me think of, um, because, you know, we think of that today, mm -hmm. right? Our best examples are animals today that a bug that looks like a leaf or, yeah. or insects that, you know, the proboscis is the perfect length for reaching into the flower. But we also get that in the fossil record. Yes. There was a study that came out a few years ago that found there was a group of lace wings, calligrammated lace wings, that were shockingly similar to butterflies. Like top to bottom looked just like butterflies, right down to the eye spots on their wings. So this is definitely something that isn't just we see in modern insects, but these adaptations have shown up over and over again. Um, right. Go ahead. And it really goes into basically the basics of how natural selection works, right? It's not so much that the genes 
know something. And I think that's part of the problem with like ideas of like the selfish gene or something like that. Genes are somehow like directing things on their own. They're pretty much passive riders. When you think about, you know, organisms, even us, like we vary obviously from each other and like any number of different traits. And given that those traits are heritable, I mean, this is what Charles Darwin elucidated in uh, Alfred Russell Wallace as well. You have animal organisms that vary, those variations are heritable. Those variations make a difference in terms of who survives and leaves more offspring and who does not. And then over time, you get just by dint of those factors, you get evolutionary change. So it's not so much that the flowers are trying to attract the insects, but there might be like a proto flower that, you know, is a little bit ornate or maybe it smells a little bit a certain way more so than the rest of them. And insects like that flower more. So it's more likely to get pollinated, more likely to leave offspring. And then you do that again and again, over and over again, until you get something entirely different. And that's how we got our biodiversity today. And not the only way, it's not just natural selection, but that's the core of how this stuff works. Well, and for the insects that resemble plants, uh, those are those can often be very counterintuitive because it is such a perfect mimicry you know you have the leaf insects with dead piece of leaf colored yeah. into their wing casing like little holes little holes that yeah. have been eaten by other hypothetical insects like it, you have some ridiculous mimicry going on and what you're seeing is the result of millions and like this is the end game of that evolution not that it was the goal you know that the genes were saying i want to look like a dead leaf it was that an insect at one point looked a little more like a dead leaf for whatever reason. It could have been a weird individual. It could have just been, you know, happenstance that when leaves started falling and glittering the ground, this colored insect happened to be doing better than the ones before it. And over time, the more like a leaf it looks, the better that group does until we now have the logical conclusion that it has gotten eerily close to a leaf. And, and so it's not trying to, it just has ended up looking that way. And insects are in a great position to be able to, to end up doing that because they reproduce very quickly. With and lots of babies. Evolution works on generations. And so the more generations you have, the more opportunity, the more change you are able to accrue. So animals that have very, or any organism that has very quick generational reproductional times can in theory accrue changes more quickly and insects a lot of insects reproduce real quick. And so you get a lot of generations in a short amount of time. They've also been doing it longer than most groups. Like they sure the have. first <laughs> terrestrial <laughs> dominators and everything. Yeah, yeah, 300 million years of trial and error to work with. It's this evolutionary arms race. And um, it, it's you see it a lot with flowers and birds too, where flowers will develop a certain shape and birds will then develop their bills into a certain shape or size to fit the shape of that flower. Mm -hmm. um, so you get these very specific partnerships between flowers and insects and flowers and birds. And um, it's just growing and evolving over time. It's Some of them are pretty fascinating. Yeah. The sunbird comes to mind with that yes. very, very pronounced hook in the beak and the cat's claw flower, which it's literally the only bird that can drink from it without destroying the plant. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. Yeah. And it's something we think about a lot. I think it's easy because of how logical the, the features can be. Like, you know, this beak obviously matches that flower. Mm -hmm. I can see the logic between this these two uh, forms. It's hard then to not picture evolution working under a logic of its own. Sure. Yeah. We always have hindsight, right? And that we don't see all the time that that didn't work. We don't see the bird that tried to feed on the flower where like even the examples that we show, it's like, this is how evolution works. And we show it like a lock and a key, but we don't show that like nine times out of 10, whatever species of bird is not going to be able to get the nectar from that flower. It's just the one. And that causes a differential, you know, results. And, and there you go. So it's like also in the imagery of how we talk about yeah. Or an insect or a bird figures out a workaround, mm -hmm. like a flower piercer, which will just go to the source where it knows the nectar is and drill into the flower, which has developed this long trumpet to prevent exactly that. But mm -hmm. it, the workaround is there. Well, it's yeah. uh, what we do with behavior all the time. We're like, this animal is specialized for this behavior. And then you can cut to a video of it eat, you know, eating the wrong food or doing something completely <laughs> weird. You know, and it's like, uh, I think of a video I saw of bears who would who were trying to get the salmon who have died after spawning by kicking them 
<laughs> over to the shore with their feet as they waded in the water <laughs> and like trying to maneuver them to the shallows where they could then reach in and grab. It's like, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. I've watched the documentaries. Go stand in the rapids. <laughs> okay, yeah, but it works. <laughs> Always trying new things. Emily asks, what kind of evidence do you look for to figure out social behavior in extinct animals? Oh, good question. Excellent question. Uh, Karen, have you ever been asked to, to do illustrations of behavior. social ancient things? Um, occasionally, yes. And my most useful tool for that is trackways. Um, because you can tell uh, under what conditions certain trackways are laid down. You can also tell whether something came through after one animal. Um, and occasionally you can tell how long that span of time was. I think there's a trackway, I want to say it's at the Royal Terrell. Um, I heard Phil Curry talk about it, and it was uh, a pachyrhinosaurus herd, and they knew that these animals were traveling together because one of them slipped in the mud and fell into the guy next to him, who then slipped in the mud and fell into the guy next to him. So they had this beautiful trackway of all of these large ceratopsians sliding around in the mud because of this domino effect. And that's, that's the evidence for those animals traveling socially together, at least in that moment in time. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> Amazing. It's very hard to interpret social behavior in the fossil yes. record. Very. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it needs a little bit of inference. For example, when we look at some feather patterns, some non-avian dinosaurs saying, okay, this is this red and white stripe pattern on something like Sinusoropter. It's this little like fuzzy. It's like a dinosaur where a cat, this is more or less what yes. you get. Um, and we're like, okay, this isn't some, this is something that like is either meant to be seen or meant to conceal. And they're, we're starting to get into some of that research now where as we're filling in dinosaur coloration, you can figure out, okay, this is counter shading. This is trying to camouflage from something, or this is something that's flashy and obviously be very, very visible. So a little bit of inference can help there, but yeah, trace fossils like tracks or bite marks are my favorite. Bite marks mm -hmm. on fossils mm -hmm. are great for getting an idea of who is eating who, when, under what circumstances. I think just today I saw a paper about a place in Northwestern China um, that seems to be a theropod feeding site where there are a ton of sauropod bones that have been bitten, they have the tooth marks on them, they've been trampled, and we can really set that scene and visualize it and not just say, okay, this was a carnivore and this was an herbivore and I think they did this. It's really like these moments in, in time that you can do that detective work and, and piece apart. Yeah, like a snapshot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty fantastic. Uh-oh. <laughs> we got a question from Trevor. <laughs> Trevor says, has it come to the point where we should just write off bad dinosaur depictions in film, read Jurassic World, or should we continue to push for scientific authenticity? Oh boy, I, this this is going to be, I'm sure we all have uh, lots of opinions about this. <laughs> awesome. well, I should say before anything else, I do work with Universal and their marketing team on some of the Jurassic World stuff, trying to get them as much dinosaur information um, as I can. That's all I can say about that, but just whatever I say afterwards. I just want to make that clear. Yes. Right, right. Yes. Um, my my perspective has always been, well, maybe not always, uh, but yeah, my now it is. <laughs> um, I don't I don't think that it is the responsibility of films to be scientifically accurate. No. I don't think that a filmmaker is a bad filmmaker if they're making things uh, uh, in you know inconsistent with reality. But I do think that it is really nice when they do because that allows them to sort of help out with this job that is so important in paleontology of communicating our ideas to the public. Yes. You know, Jurassic Park is this great example where like yeah. Jura everything in Jurassic Park, right? The stuff that Jurassic Park got wrong became household misconceptions about paleontology and the stuff that it got right, it introduced like Jurassic Park introduced the general public to this idea of birds and dinosaurs uh, being related, mm -hmm. right? Velociraptor was just named in like 1923 or 24, mm -hmm. and it became a household name after 1993. So movies have this incredible power to shape the public understanding and image of, of fossil creatures. And I don't think that they are required to do it but it's really nice as a paleontologist and it can be really helpful uh, and it can be really 
exciting to see reflections of reality worked into these fictional landscapes in the movies. Well, my, to add to that, because I, I agree with all that, and the the extra bit that I always think of is that for them to be slightly more accurate, you know, not like meticulously, did you check the most recent research? No, I mean, as long as you're trying to get as close to the ballpark, you know, that, that would be fantastic. But it does that it doesn't cost them much. That most of the things they could do to be more accurate would not have changed the way they utilized those dinosaurs in the film. Like adding feathers to the to some of the dinosaurs would not have changed Jurassic World plot or you know story at all. You know stuff like that. That it's not you know it's not going to cost much to add in correct facts. And what a missed opportunity, especially with the the raptors. Um, I just think about how cool that would have looked, and and how much the creature designers would have been able to really get in there and do some amazing work. There, there are a lot of really brilliant paleo artists out there working in 3D, and they would love to be involved in stuff like that. Yeah. I think to some degree it requires taking these movies on their own terms. Like I love the first Jurassic Park film adaptation. Like I was 10 at the time. That was the biggest thing that happened. I love the fact that these were the closest that I'd ever seen to living dinosaurs other than birds but like the, the models and the use of um you know actual practical effects like made them so real and this was like the best dinosaur science at the time and now we've retconned that a bit and so they were never supposed to be 100 percent accurate and i don't think it would take a lot to as, as all of you mentioned to make them more accurate i think that would be a lot more interesting like i would love to see a big fluffy therizinosaur like waddle out on screen even just in a cameo just because like how neat these animals yeah they just inherently are and i guess jurassic world even tried to make that point of you know this weird thing it's a, it's a corporation pushing dinosaurs but also kind of criticizing itself like i don't know what that was about but to some extent it's, it's a monster movie now like i love those little movies i like and that's where it is but I think the problem, and this is the same thing with Ammonite as well, the Mary Anning um, biopic that actually has nothing to do with her real story outside of you know, her being a paleontologist and being on the south coast of England. It's that when we only have one thing, then there's so much pressure on that thing to be everything for everybody. If Jurassic, the Jurassic World series were just a monster movie, then that would be fine if we had like two or three other dinosaur franchises, let's say, that like, had more accurate dinosaurs that Halo people would love. Well, it's just—it's like the only game in town at this point. I think it'd be awesome if we have some dino competition down the line, but we'll see if that happens. Yeah, no, I agree. So with if that. we have budding filmmakers out there, give us a call. <laughs> uh, so now I know that we are nearing the end of our of our time here. So let's see if we can get through a few more questions. Uh, Raphael asks, "Do you have fav any? Do you have any favorite anachronism in paleontology?" Hmm. Hmm. I have to think about that. I think for me, I, like just to throw something out there so I don't think for too long, it might be Basilosaurus. I love how many animals there are that have names that are nowhere close to what that animal actually is because of an initial assumption that was made on a fragment or something. Mm -hmm. So Basilosaurus, if you're not familiar with the animal, it's um, about a 55, 50 million year old whale, really long. You probably see it in paleo art somewhere. Still have these really gnarly teeth, these teeth to catch at the front, these sharp cheek teeth that have this really long kind of slender body. And it was named, this. Yeah. <laughs> and it was originally named, um, well, it was given a couple of names, it's called Zeglodon, uh, because it had, that means a two yoked tooth, just for like the tooth shape. But it was named just prior to that by somebody else, and then Bacillosaurus, because I thought it was a big marine reptile of some yeah. kind. And since that name has priority, it's stuck all through time. So even though we know this is this iconic early whale, so important to our idea of this transition, we still have to call it King Lizard. Yep. Yep. And that happens a lot. Oviraptor. Yep. The famous example of oh, the yeah. egg thief that was stealing what turned out to probably be its own eggs. So all sorts of fun examples of that. And to think that, you know, it's, again, the CT scanner, just, well, let's see whose eggs these are. And it 
flipped the entire story. I, I still, I have books from my childhood that literally have protoceratops on that nest with Obi Raptor coming in, sneaking in behind, trying to get those eggs. No, no, opposite. I what I want to know is like what those little Dromaeosaurid jaws were doing in that nest. Because in that site, if I recall correctly, there were dinosaur eggs from other dinosaurs. So were they washed in? Yeah. Was that like an example of nest parasitism? We've right. never found another example, but that's where my brain wants to go and I want it to be true. <laughs> yeah, that's the nest parasitism story. That's, uh, yeah, I'm right there with you, right? That'd be so cool. <laughs> do we want to do, let's see, let's see. Emily, mm. nomenclature question: Is it paleo snack or paleo snack? Hmm. Hang on, let me let me ponder this with my <laughs> my three D printed fossil snake vertebrate. <laughs> yeah. hmm. I, I would vote for paleo, but without the extra uh, British A. I, I, I think that you got to maintain that paleo in there. I think it's paleo snack. I think so. Agreed. Now, there you go. That's the official. Uh, uh, word. We voted. We'll let the ICZN know. <laughs> uh, another next question. What is your favorite dinosaur name? Crewy Vastator. Say it again. Crewy Vastator. Crewy Vastator. Yeah. What does that mean? That's the uh, the um. It's that's with Zool Crewy Vastator. Oh, yeah. Zool. Uh, yes. Zool, the destroyer of shins, is yep. the ankylosaur that was named not too long ago with the first name, the genus name being after Zool from Ghostbusters. So I, I'm a big fan of Epidexipteryx. Uh, just because. Be <laughs> <laughs> Epidexipteryx. And you have to kind of say it that way, right? Like you have to kind of parcel it out because otherwise, if you run over it, yeah, it's, just, yeah. Right. I mean, it's not going to surprise anybody that I love Brontosaurus. I mean, Thunder Lizard is just such an awesome name. And I love the fact that before it started to come back into use, thanks to that recent paper in 2015, the lack of a Brontosaurus led to the naming of Brontomerus, which is another sauropod whose name means thunder thighs because I had all the five month <laughs> attachment. So, yes. for the price of one, I love it. <laughs> Sigi Malik and Falcarius are my two mm -hmm. favorites because they both sound like they should be on a standard bearer yes. on a Game of Thrones spinoff. Yeah, that's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, I want to expand that question and ask, do you all have a favorite taxonomic name that is not a dinosaur? Because my favorite taxonomic name of all time is not a dinosaur. And while Jeez. you think about it, I'll, I'll share mine. My absolute favorite fossil name uh, belongs to the Late Cretaceous Devil Toad yes. of Madagascar. I was ninety percent sure. Beelzebufo. <laughs> yes. oh, I love it so much. Just the best name. <laughs> this may not be my actual favorite, but the one that keeps bringing to mind is Patriophila. So it's this Eocene uh, creodon. Hey, we're winding up where we started. <laughs> um, yeah. That its name means father cat, but it wasn't a cat at all. Like it's been thought to be related to seals and other things. It turns out it's just this weird archaic jaguar-like. Carnivore, but uh, yeah, I just love how kind of like dramatic that name sounds like the beginning of something. There's a Nimravid at uh, the John Day fossil beds named Paganodon, which I just think is fun to say. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of, um, I think, Longridge et al. Uh, several years ago named a lizard Obamadon. <laughs> Which, Obama which, tooth? Yep, the nice. Obama tooth. Wow. And it was some weird justification, like this, the, 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 what was it? It was like the, the sh straightened, pr proper <laughs> shape of the tooth or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> which you don't have to do at all. It's not required. You say, I just want to name it like that. So like going for the stretch just kind of makes it worse. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, it's like my favorite is Ninjemis, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. which means mm -hmm. Ninja Turtle. And the author who named in Jemmy straight up said in the paper, named after that fearsome foursome. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. It's really good. Uh, all right. Hey, thanks everyone for asking all these questions. This was awesome. Uh, I know that uh, we have our Dragon Con Discord uh, that will be up and we'll be hopping in there. And if people have more questions on there, they can interact with us and ask those. This has been fantastic. Yes. We're so happy we were able to do our big paleo panel again this year, even yeah. though 2020 is the most ridiculous year of modern times. Dragon Con still happened. This panel still happened. And we're thrilled that we were able to get people from all over the place, uh, not just on our panel, but in our audience. 
before we go, let's go around and, and let everybody tell people where they can be found. So Riley, where can people find you? Sure, you can find me on both Twitter and Instagram at Laylaps. There we yeah. go, up on the yeah. screen. <laughs> and Karen? I am on Twitter as the Odd Angel and Instagram as simply Odd Angel. All right, for a cool uh, art, uh, scientific illustration. <laughs> and then we are, uh, the best place to find us is the Common Descent podcast. That is our uh, podcast that we do. We are at Common Descent PC on Twitter because it doesn't fit. And we are at Common Descent podcast on Instagram because Instagram is a little bit better uh, yep. when it comes to that. Uh, and from there, you can also find us. We have personal Twitter uh, accounts, which I don't know. Hey, there we go. Hey, that's yeah. me. I'm Demos150 on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can follow me for you know, general musings about various <laughs> things. And then Will is also on yeah, both. I don't post much. <laughs> <laughs> this has been great. And before we wrap up, uh, thanks to everybody uh, for watching. Thanks to Riley and Karen for joining us again. This was great. This was so much fun. Thanks. Riley, so happy you got to be our oh, new addition. Thank you so much for the invite. This has been so much fun. And a huge thanks to all the DragonCon crew uh, especially our science track people for making this happen uh, behind the scenes here this whole time. We've had Dustin and Steven making things work. And I know the whole science track and Dragon Con crew have been working extra double super time uh, to make this awesome. unprecedented virtual Dragon Con a reality. So huge thanks to all of those people. And yeah, follow us in all the places. Bring us more paleo questions. We will answer them forever. Anytime. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.